Yes, guys, I'm Sai. Welcome back to Ace Podcast Nation. Uh, we're here for another episode of My Story at Eat Sleep Media, and I'm delighted to be joined uh, by Wales legend, ex Swansea, ex Cardiff, Mr. Andy Legg. How are you, my friend? Afternoon. It's very, very, very. I've been looking forward to this all week, mate. As I've got to say, I always look forward to coming in here, but I've been particularly looking forward to this. Um, we had you on the football show before, me and uh, me and Andy, and that was good. It was well received. And uh, I was just looking forward to having you in face to face. It's different. Uh, you can have a proper chat and share, so hear some stories from you and talk about football, talk about Cardiff, no doubt. Probably about Swansea, I suppose. Well, talk about them now. But um, first of all, mate, I'd like you to settle an argument between myself and my wife and, and my in law, my mother in law as well, really. So, Neath and Port Talbot. Are they in Swansea? 50 50. Okay. Yeah, absolutely split down the line. Um, if you go to Patalbot, probably a little bit more Cardiff. If you go to Neath, probably a little bit, bit more Swansea. Okay. So if you were born in Neath Hospital, for instance? Which is no longer there. Okay. But would that be uh, a Swansea birth or a Cardiff birth? Or like yeah, um, out, outer, outside the Swansea birth? It's right in between, you know, it's, it's, fi- it's, it's 50-50, <laughs> it is really 50-50, yeah. but I would say more Neath is more Swansea, I would thought. That's what I say, and I, like, when I wind my, uh, my missus and my, her mum up, I'll say, what's the postcode, and it's SW or whatever, isn't it? but uh, it's only a bit of fun, but uh, yeah, settles an argument, they don't, like <laughs> it. they don't like it because they're all Cardiff fans, and I like to remind them of it, but um, you're one of the few, mate, who... Uh, who played for both and I don't know maybe it's uh, like a confabulated memory on my behalf because I was a lot younger but I don't really remember you getting a lot of grief as like someone who did both I'm sure you might remember it differently but like yeah I remember well it just doesn't uh, leave you but when I first came down I think the first three months was uh, really tough was it? yeah um, Probably after three months, I went to see um, the manager, which was Frank Burrows, obviously. Um, he was the only man who could have took me to Cardiff. Yeah. Because um, I played him in Swansea. Loved playing underneath him. He was um, a brilliant manager. I loved him to bits. And um, he persuaded me to come down. And um, But the, three, the first three months was tough. After three months, I did go and see him and said, I think I made a mistake. <laughs> and um, he said, no, bear with me, bear with me. Um, and he had a little plan up his sleeve and... What his plan worked, and uh, the rest is history. Yeah, rest you know, I uh, had a great career at Cardiff then, and really enjoyed my time there. Were you apprehensive about coming down here initially? Yeah, at first, yeah, definitely. You know, because obviously the rivalry between Swansea and Cardiff, and I obviously played for Swansea against Cardiff uh, numerous times, so that was always in the back of my mind and the rivalry and whatever. Um, but when I spoke to Frank and um, he. he his persuasion um he just said you know come down you'll win the fans over blah 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 and and i love i love frank anyway so yeah. that was that was the draw to me i knew cardiff had great lot of fans and supporters and i thought if i could win them over i know i'd enjoy myself and that's how it turned out to be and i mean i'm sure three months that three months probably seemed like quite a long three months but in the grand scheme of things, three months is nothing, is it, really? In terms of being able to win over fans who, where you've come, you know, you've come from their most bitter rival. Yeah, it was... Um, but I'm sure it felt longer to you. It did, the three months did, because uh, I, I went on to my wife and I said, uh, I think I'm in a mistake, what should we do? And she said, go and see the manager, see what he says. And um, anyway, it was, you know, it's in the past now, and I had, you know, such a good time there, um, probably... The, I would say probably the best time of my career. Um, I know because of my age as well. Um, obviously, Sam and Man taking over as well, and the club on the rise. It was probably the best time to be at Cardiff City. So I had, I had a great time, and uh, when I was injured, wasn't very often to be fair, or no. suspended or whatever. I used to sit, stand in the A block with the fans, uh, and I stood there. I think I stood there for about two weeks in a row. Without them even knowing I was in there. <laughs> and then I got spotted eating a burger in there. So, <laughs> But uh, no, I had, a, I had a great time. And I'm, I'm one of those. Uh, I, I, 
I tried 100% for whatever club I played for, uh, yeah. whether if it was Notts County or Birmingham City or even Reading, which I, di I, I didn't like it there. Um, I tried 100% to, 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 to give the fans what they wanted, the effort. Yeah, and I think ultimately football fans generally, but you know Cardiff fans, I can speak for being one myself. Like they appreciate when you've got a player who will run through brick walls. Not in your case, but like in other players' case, if they are, if they're not the greatest technically, they'll do their best and they'll run and they'll run and they'll put the effort in. Fans will forgive a bit of if you know you're not Ronaldo or something like that, and it's just sometimes I think that's the frustration I think with modern footballers generally is it feels like when you've seen players like yourself and Willie Boland and you know all the guys who've come through Ninian Park and Cardiff City Stadium who've put their bodies on the line and run and run for 90 minutes and then sometimes you see modern day players for the lack of a better term who maybe not just modern day players but players who aren't willing to put in that same effort I think fans can spot that quite quickly yeah, I think I, I was lucky with the team I I joined. Um, I think they were all down to earth. They all worked. Um, we were a team on and off the pitch. Um, and then when the likes of Kavanagh came and, and Peter Thorne, um, yeah, obviously the quality rose. But, you know, he, the people like Leo Fortune West wasn't the most gifted player in the world, but Hart, he had plenty of it. Um, it was a nuisance to play against, you know, as well. So... I I was lucky at Cardiff, you know. I didn't play with the the modern day football players like you say, and I think I would tear my hair out because yeah. I was frustrated with some of the players I played with, but they worked. So if I, in this day and age, I don't know what I would be like. I'd probably get sent <laughs> off every game. I think get arguing with your own players. What well, um you were you was at the start, I think, of the the kind of revolution at Cardiff, weren't you? This the beginning of it, the promotion of the Millennium Stadium, and kind of all led to where they are today with the new stadium and that and you know you've got sort of uh, older fans like myself who were very much tied to Ninian Park and kind of bemoaned those days but you do have to move on and you have to move with the times and I think as much as um, I look back and I think oh I miss Ninian Park and I miss the atmosphere and this and that it was kind of probably at a it was ready to be moved on. I think it was there was parts of it which were falling apart. And I think so. I think you know Sam had that sort of vision when he came in. He went to a new uh, stadium for the city, and you know we loved playing at Ninian Park. Um, the atmosphere was incredible, and I, I liked the old grounds. I liked the Elm Parks. I liked the the Vetches. I liked the, you know Ninian Park and Probably. the Mansfields of the world and. It was more atmosphere, uh, where these days I think they, they sat back and it, the, the crowd is too far away from the yeah. fans to get really involved and the atmosphere is not the same when, when, when people are standing. and So I can I can totally understand, but yeah, it, it had to go, you know, yeah. every, every, every club has got to advance and this day and age is a business, it's not a game of football. Yeah, and uh, you know, look, that's got its benefits, of course, but ultimately clubs have got to stay afloat we've seen so many clubs who've ended up folding over the last you know in recent probably last 10 15 years so many big historical clubs as well and i think if anyone thinks that their club outside of the real real big boys like i think anyone who thinks their club is safe no matter what is probably kidding themselves you've got to be very careful um what you wish for in terms of owners but also like how your clubs run and and things like that and like, you know, I know the Cardiff owners and the board take their fair, their fair share of, of uh, criticism, which I think is fair. I think most recently with the manager sacking is certainly fair. But on the other hand, they have, uh, he's also put a lot of money in to keep the club afloat and keep the club going where other owners might have sort of pushed more towards administration and things like that. So I do think you've got to be be careful what you wish for and also like going back to Sam and Man, um, people you know criticize him for things that have gone on since but you know he was the catalyst for the change when he came in the whole um, the whole atmosphere changed didn't it it was um, and you know I was no more I fell up with Sam towards the end of my career at Cardiff and that's why I left the actual club okay. um, 
but when you look back and you look what Sam Amman did for the club, um, he raised the profile. It was going nowhere. You know, we were lang languishing in the third division. And we got promotion under him, promotion under him. The wages went up, the crowds came back. He had that excitement there. Yes, he was a little bit naughty towards the end. Um, you know, he probably he probably knows that himself. But listen, I get one phone call off him probably a year. Yeah. And um, and his first words are, how am I club, baby? Mm -hmm. You know, he, he still thinks of it as his club. Yeah. Um, he's still got feelings for it. And, you know, for all of the wrongdoings he did, he raised the profile and probably Cardiff wouldn't probably be there where they were without him. 100%. 100%. I remember when he when he came in and it was all it was a bit of a mad feeling because where Cardiff were and everyone knew who Sam and Mam was from Wimbledon and the crazy gang and all you know everyone had seen those kind of crazy videos on I know like football focus and stuff like this of them yeah. the, the music and the changing rooms and the pranks and all this sort of thing so everyone you know and it wasn't like today with social media and things like that it was very much little snippets on TV and stuff, but everyone knew who he was, and it was all. I just remember being like, "Oh my God, I can't believe he's, you know, he's coming into Cardiff. This is going to be, uh, this is going to be interesting." You didn't even at that very early stage as a fan, you didn't know, like what what to expect. You didn't know whether this was just going to be a bit of a car crash or whether it was going to go well or whether it was going to. And I think, I look back at that time really fondly as a fan. And I look back at it as like, I think a lot of the issues came at the very end of his tenure and yeah. when he left. But the actual time that he spent in charge and, you know, the, obviously the Leeds game and things like that spring to mind. But for me, it was the the promotions, the, the, the fans coming back and going from watching with very little fans to suddenly getting near enough full houses and things to get 21,000 in the third division is, is credit to the fans and like I say I think Sam brought that back mm. he raised that profile again because as we say we were in the third division yeah we were, we were challenging you know when I first came in with Frank and I think we got promoted that year and then relegated in 2000 um, and then we started off a little bit iffy again on, a, on the following year but I think Sam deserved a lot of credit, as I say, and yeah, a little bit of criti criticism as well because what he did was a little bit naughty. But I think mainly the most of the fans, the diehards, would say, you know, he raised the standards. Yeah, and he he um, he gave the fans the time of day as well as his lead, and um, he he mingled with the fans and he talked to the fans, which was quite a, a strange it's thing. Unique, yeah. yeah, like we weren't used to that at all, and I think. It was, uh, yeah, like I say, very fond memories. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you, you mentioned a minute ago, or towards the start, about Frank Burrows had a plan uh, when you went to see him after the three months. Anything you wanted to sort of elaborate on in yeah. terms of how he was going to... He was mad, really, because um, I went in to see him and I said, look, I said, I've, I've made a mistake, so I'm, um, Frank, I need to think about leaving the club. Okay. And he said, uh, no, it's all right. give, give me 10 days. So we played on the Saturday, and then the following week... I think we were playing Swansea in the Welsh Cup. I think it was the Welsh Cup, but it was a cup game anyway. And I was the only first team player playing in that game. Oh, a couple of borderline players, yeah. but I was only like first regular. First yeah, player. and I thought to myself, why am I playing here? <laughs> so I I just carried on and I trained and I was mourning about it because I didn't want to play and because yeah. nobody else was playing. And um, little Jimmy Goodfellow came up to me uh, bless him, God rest his soul. And um, he said, "You know, we're gonna to do tonight, legs." I said, uh, "Yeah, gonna score." Mm -hmm. And he went, "No, it's quite easy." He said, "I'll tell you when you're on your way out." So I'm sitting in the dressing room and I'm pondering. I'm thinking, "What yeah, have I got to do in this well. game?" I thought oh, they're gonna put me captain or something to yeah, just to try. And yeah. So them. I'm walking out and Jimmy pulls me and he said, uh, "Right, first tackle, smash somebody." Mm -hmm. I said, what if I get sent off? He said, don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> he said, that's why you're playing. And I made one tackle and it was like, that was it. That was it. Cardiff fans sang my name for 90 minutes and then the Swansea fans hated me for 90 minutes. Yeah. But it was that one tackle that turned the fans to like me. It was incredible. And Clever. it was obviously Frank had planned this mm. ahead saying, you know, we'll get him in there and we'll play him against Swansea or whatever. It's clever, really, isn't it? Because, like, 
the one thing which is going to win fans over is seeing you play against Swansea and being, you know, full, fully committed as you always were. But like flying into a tackle early shows it that early intent. So it's, it's a clever plan. That's it why is. I I, I, yeah. I was interested in what the plan was, and I'm quite I'm quite impressed with that. I like that. And so after that, it was you had no no sort of issues. Or Nothing anything. whatsoever. It was like because um, I'd scored uh, when I first came in. I think I scored at uh, Plymouth away, which is rivalry as well. And the fans didn't like it. A few spits and a few stones mm-hmm. come at me, and then I scored up Rochdale. I come on a seven scored. Same again. Um, in the meantime, Jason Bowen was still at Reading, and he kept ringing me and saying, "You know, shall I come now?" <laughs> and I said, "No, I'm still getting hammered." <laughs> but but it was it was you know in a way, it helped me because I was determined to win them over because I that's the person I was. I one one of the most skillful world in person in the world. But I want I give up my lot for it. Whatever yeah. whatever game is, nobody goes on the field wanting to make mistakes. And my my thought of issue was, if I run about for ninety minutes and try my try my nuts off, then mm. people will um, forgive me for the mistakes I made. So if I score an own goal or I miss a pass or I miss a, a chance. So they'll forgive me because I've tried 100%. Now, if I don't try and I do things like that, I get criticism. Yeah. So and I, I think because I came up from non-league as well, I think it helped me um, because I didn't come into the game until I was 22. So, so you had that work ethic. Yeah. Because that's quite late, really, in it, to start. Well, 22, yeah, it was amazing, really. And I've, for the amount of games I played, um, I think I played over 700 games from 22. So... You know, I missed probably three three seasons. Yeah. So, um, so, did you think before, like you know, when you're sort of twenty one or whatever, you thought you know the chance had gone? Do you, I'd never even thought of being a professional football player. I was. Um, so it's, that's I, mad, that isn't it? I played tennis. Um, I was quite decent at tennis. Um, I used to do a bit of motocross, and. I used to play football on a Saturday for my my dad's team. My dad's team played in the neat league then, and then I left my dad's team to go and play for Ponte Dowie in the Welsh league. And I went from Ponte Dowie. I only played for a month in Ponte Dowie, and I went to Britain Ferry. And then I played for Britain Ferry. I think for two three months, and then all of a sudden it was like, you go into Man City, you go into Middlesbrough, you go into Swansea, and Wolves. And I think to myself, what what's this about? And it was like, all of a sudden it was just a hit. Hadn't even occurred to you. No, I just did, never even you thought of being a professional footballer. Never thought of being one. Oh. Um, never entered my brain when I was in so- school. Never, it was never a focus of mine. Yeah. So when you say when you used to play football like as a teenager, as a kid, were you in like you know like the county and the the different representative teams and stuff? like No, that? because I pl- I played in goals until I was fifteen. I used to play odd out now and then. Yeah, but generally, um, just but generally I used to be in goals. Mad, yeah. you good at tennis? I was decent at tennis. I was half decent at tennis. Yeah, I was um, won a couple of to- yeah single uh, um, yeah single tournaments, but locally Neath, um, I won that tournament and went down to Swansea and did okay in that tournament. And but I wasn't good enough to get to really push on. Not to push on, no. What about any other sports then? Rugby? No, I hated rugby. Yeah, me too. Yeah, Table comes- tennis. Good I'm not bad at table tennis. Oh, we'd have to play, mate. Yeah, we'll have a knock on that. I know. I, um, I got this thing that I think I'm unbeatable at table tennis. <laughs> I'm sure I'll come against someone. Some, because um, when I was in my early, I was always all right. I was always like all right to sport generally. I was good at football and good at cricket, but I was all right at most sports like as a teenager. And then I met this girl in my sort of teens, German girl who played for Germany in table tennis. So she'd have to go and you know do training and stuff, and I would just literally just while she was training, I'd just be playing table tennis for hours just with you know, whoever wasn't yeah. playing, and then we went on my boys' football tour just before COVID. It was the last one before COVID. He was, and they're all like twelve, eleven, twelve or whatever, and you got all the dads are there, and then obviously because I walk with a stick, and I they underestimated when I and yeah. I stayed on for like. I think it was a day and a half and no one could beat me. So I clung to that. I filmed it as well. No, I do it. <laughs> got to film it. Yeah, yeah so. absolutely. But uh, no, no, I, I enjoy it. Table t- for me now, like table tennis, is it's the only sport really I can do, maybe yeah. apart from a little bit of swimming. So 
for me, it gives that bit of competition, like, and a bit of um, the, all the things was I lost when I had to stop playing football and cricket and things like that. Like, I enjoyed the banter of being in the changing rooms and all that, but I also enjoyed the competition. Yeah. And the kind of the battle of skills and the battle of wits and stuff. But enough about me. Let's talk about you some more. What about um? What was the most unpleasant experience you had as a professional footballer? Probably Whether it was a game or um, a like probably my time when I went to Reading. I think um, I'd gone to Reading uh, under a certain manager. Um, and within a couple of weeks, that certain manager got the sack. In came another manager. I don't want to mention names because it's not mm. fair. Um, yeah. And that certain manager divided the the squad that were there. Um, what he did, he put a bunch of players to your left, say, and a bunch of right players to your right, and a bunch of players in the middle. And he said, "Like you, don't like you, you were like that." Yeah. Well, nice. I was in the like. And then my best mate was in the dislike. Yeah. So he sort of said, "Don't you lot bother with them?" And I said, "No, that's my best yeah. mate." And 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 it went from bad to worse. Um, God, that's a way to divide the dressing room. It right? was, a, and to be fair, he walked in with, uh, I think it was eight players, I think six from Scotland, one from Ireland. Uh, but he brought like, players with him? He brought players in behind him, yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. So he was, he wanted to change the squad, he wanted to change the look of the team and whatever. But I must say that uh, John Majeski at the time was the chairman. He was absolutely brilliant. I couldn't, um, I couldn't speak highly enough of him. He, he, um, he looked after me. Um, and I was still playing to be fair mm. I was still in the first team um, and we had a major fallout and I needed to get away from there and that's when Frank came knocking at the door Listen, he heard that I was unhappy at Reading um, I had a couple of other clubs I could have gone to I think it was Huddersfield at the time I think Luton and I think another one I think but I didn't even, I, I did speak to Huddersfield I didn't speak to the other two and I just spoke to Frank and that was it but um, yeah I think I was the most unpleasant time of my career was was Reading I think if you've got um, uh, a manager or someone you work with who you trust and things go badly somewhere else and then you have the opportunity to go to a place where that person is who you trust, it's a no-brainer, isn't it? Yeah. Because you know that, all right, even as it was, it was difficult going to Cardiff, especially the early period, but you knew Frank Burroughs was there and you knew you trusted him. So even if you had the, the teething problems, shall we say, with the fans and, yeah. and the rivalry with Swansea and stuff you had Frank Burrows there who you could straight away go to and say yeah I think I you know well Frank you know, obviously managed Cardiff and then yeah. he came to Swansea um, and he turned Swansea around um, and Frank was the actual one who got rid of me at Swansea mm-hmm. um, and I, it, I'll tell you the exact game we played uh, West Brom in the playoffs we won the first leg 2-1 at home at the Vetch and we lost the return leg uh, away at uh, the Albion and it, after that game Frank had pulled me out of the dressing room and actually said to me you're leaving the club and I said why and he said because the chairman won't pay you what you're worth he said you've got to leave the club I won't mention my wages but they were very very low I was probably the lowest in the team mm. uh, the f- year before that I was a top goal scorer um, so Frank actually took me down to Ozzy Ardelius's room that day after the game and sat me down with Ozzy Ardelius and said, you're, you're coming here next year. And I said, all right, OK. So we discussed wages and signing on fees. And I didn't know what his signing on fee was because I never had one at Swansea. No, of course, because you'd come from Britain Ferry. Yeah. And so signing on fees, pardon, what, what are they? Yeah. So I spoke to Ozzy, agreed uh, terms. Um, told me to go away to I was going to Florida at the time I went away to Florida came back Ozzy had left and gone to Spurs but Ozzy in the meantime had rang me while I was in Florida and told me this so he said I want you to go to the Albion if you do well at the Albion I'll take you to Spurs okay so it was um, Ozzy's assistant manager took over it was the old Spurs manager as well I won't mention his name. Plenty of links there. Yeah, so I went, when I came home, I went back up, and he revoked on the deal. No. He wanted to cut my wages, wanted to cut the sign-on fee, and I said, no, this is what I agreed with Ozzy. 
I'm a man of principle. If you, if that's not what you're going to stick to, I'm yeah, going somewhere else. Somewhere. I ended up. I spoke to Portsmouth, Luton. Um, didn't want to go. I could have gone to Wimbledon. I think at the time. Didn't want to go to London. And Notts County came in for me last last minute. So I drove up to Notts County. And the chairman said to me, "I can't give you what Portsmouth offered you, and I can't give you what so and so offered you, and I can't give you what so and so offered you." He said, "But we're a good little club, and we look after you." And I felt at home there. Yeah. So it didn't matter about money for me. Trust. I that. just had a, a a gut feeling to go there, and that's where I went. So I could have gone. To, I could have gone to other clubs for, for quite a bit more money. Yeah. But it wasn't about money for me, because uh, I obviously come from non-league. I was. Playing football for a living was like novelty, like yeah, a dream yeah. anyway. So, um, and I went to Notts County and had a great time. To be fair, yeah, yeah. So, a couple of things from that which um, really kind of strike me. Um, first of all, with the West Brom thing, with them go, with him going back on that deal, like see to me, that would set alarm bells, which it clearly did to you anyway. Because I would think, right, we had an agreement, and even though the managers changed, you're part of his. Sort of, you're part of his coaching yeah. circle. So if you're willing to go back on that deal, you know, if I agree to whatever he was offering, what's to say that then something else is going to change, yeah. or in six weeks' time he he's going to try and you know he's going to have me training with the reserves, or like I wouldn't, the trust wouldn't be there. No, and I think that's a big importance if you're going to work with someone, especially in football where things can change so quickly. You need to trust the people you're working with. You need to trust your teammates. You need to trust the manager, but also then, the other thing which struck me was when you went to uh, Notts County and you said like you could have got money elsewhere. It's sometimes you do. You just get a feeling about people, about places or you know work teams, whatever it may be. And I think I think it helped going to Notts because they had six to one women as well, mind you. So I think oh, that, 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 that could have been an attraction. <laughs> that's it, that's, well, I'm but, all I'm all about the stats, me. But. So. Uh, the chairman did mention it at the time, actually. He said, yeah, well, my I was his selling point. I can't pay you this much. He said, but we have six to one women. I said, where's the contract? <laughs> but no, I, it, it was it was a good time for me. Um, 93, I went there. And I was there nearly three years. And funny enough, I'm going back there Tuesday as a guest um, for one of the games. I'm, di- I'm so gutted that where they are now, because they were a championship side when I was there. Um, nearly got promoted yeah, to the Premier League. Say, they very, very nearly got to the Premier League. And um, to see where they are now is, is oh, it kills me. Because uh, it's such a good club. You know, it's a, it's, it's not, if you can explain it, it's not a club as in supporters club. It's like a family club. I was going to say, it's like, a, um, from what, the, what I know of it, it's like yeah, a family club. It is. Club. It's like a family club. Um, totally different to Forest. You know, Forest get more crowds, obviously. They get 33,000 or 32,000 now. We used to get about eighteen or seventeen, eighteen thousand, but it, it was just such a nice atmosphere, such a fam- family orientated uh, club. Um, loved the way it was run, great little stadium. Uh, it had everything, but to see where they are now, devastated. And same for Wrexham, to be fair, you know, I'm devastated yeah. to see where they well, are. Well, I don't know. I, I was devastated for them about two seasons ago. I think now they're uh, they're very much on the up. Oh yes, they're on the up. Um, I think they'll be. And back I hope, where they belong. I hope they come back into the league because you know it's been 14, 14 years yeah, since they've been yeah, out of the league, and too long. You know, there's so many clubs in that league now, the national league. Nobody, you know, it, it should so be another there's league. There's a lot of sleeping giants yeah. in there, isn't there? Yeah, you know, the likes of Oldham are down there now. The Chesterfields are down there. Incredible, that it's is. it's crazy. But like with Notts County, like um, just as they nearly made it the Premier League, I think I think I'm correct in saying a couple of seasons ago. They very nearly were sort of close to um, not going out of business as such, but I think they were struggling for a while because the clubs in that um, when there's a, there's a few clubs in that area, isn't there? Nottingham Way and oh, it's a lot. You know, if you take you got Derby County just up the road, Forest across the road, um, Leicester's only not far, forty minutes away, Chesterfield's only forty minutes away, Mansfield is just half an hour. Drop a pin. There's yeah, it's six or seven. There's clubs six or seven around. clubs around you, and uh, it I must mean, be difficult for the smaller clubs in that group to get investment and sponsors yeah. and the rest of it because everyone's going to go for the you know the Forest or the Leicester and the you know Premier League teams yeah. and whatever. 
But um, it's good to see all those teams still going. But I'm like you. I look at that league and I see like Oldham and Notts County and things like that. And I think, God, oh, they should be. They yeah, should be the, in the football, the football league, league clubs. You know, it was good, good to see Stockport getting back in this year because our Stockport role was in the league. Um, you know, it's 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 another league now. It should be uh, classed as another league, as in maybe two or three go up mm. instead of the one and one playoff. I think it's very difficult to get out of that league, and it's so disappointing for clubs who don't make it. Yeah, and I mean, pretty much every other league, top two, top three, or top two and playoffs, isn't it? Yeah. Whereas for some reason it's one up, one down. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, and I think actually that would be a from a financial point of view for the for the league for the clubs if you can build like a little system like what you've got in the championship in league one league two where you have top two and then you know four teams go into the playoffs you can make that into a uh, something which raises funds for the clubs for the league and stuff like that yeah. and make it its own little events you know playoff weeks is one of my favorite weeks of the of the season for the championship because it's such oh, it's nothing it's such nothing a tense better. week yeah there's it? nothing better than you know the best the best form of of promotion is probably winning the the playoff, playoff final you know yeah i mean i i say that i experienced i've experienced both as a fan with cardiff so andy scoring at the millennium stadium was one of the best days of my life like just not even in just in football is one of the best days of my life just it was such a good day but when we won the league to go to the Premier League, it was the, we kind of won it, and not at a canter, but we won the league. So it was just, by the time sort of the last, whatever games it was, five games left or whatever, you, you almost, you were confident and you were, there was no pressure. There was no stress that had had, you know, previous years we had lost to Stoke and not made the playoffs and we'd, you know, we'd missed out on the Premier League playoffs and, um, you know all different things that you experience as a fan, and it's quite stressful when you you know you're counting the goals and the goal difference and the wins and <laughs> what we need to be. So how do you think? The, how do you think the players feel? Well, but no, it's nothing better. Honestly, I, I I had promotion obviously a couple of times, um, but that day at Cardiff that will that will live with me for forever because it was special. Wasn't it? it was special because in our own city as well, I, yeah. it was amazing. You know to, how lucky were we. Normally we're in Wembley, we're at, we're in our own city. It was a sea of blue. Um, I don't think I went home for two days after no. the game. It was in. I I think my like a dream, my wife or my ex-wife, like I should say, now she uh, left me about eleven o'clock at night. She'd had enough and she'd gone home. And I think I got home in two days' time, <laughs> which was <laughs> and she she knew I was still alive because I was ringing yeah. and stuff. But it was incredible. It was just. Um, it was an amazing achievement and to win in an old city um, and the way we did it as well with Andy coming on and I, I can remember this Kavanagh, Kavanagh's face on the pitch when he took a inshore off Yeah. and he looked at me and he went <laughs> and, we th and I went but Earnshaw, Ernie had scored like he scored oh, 35 goals he was amazing that year Earnshaw absolutely amazing he you could you could count on Ernie to to score a goal if he was having a stinker because yeah. he just had that knack of being in the right place at the right time. He was such a good finisher, and when he took him off, especially when you need a goal, you know, even if he's playing bad, you knew Ernie had to have a chance somewhere. And uh, when he brought Andy on and the uh, the ball was played over the top, and you think, oh my, one on one, and I thought to myself, he's he's gonna run out the keeper and he, he just loved it and I thought to myself oh no what's he doing <laughs> and when I seen it going in I tell the eruption of the stadium and the noise you as a player I've been in the stands when the noise uh, you can hear it but yeah. it actually comes down on you it was deafening it was I just we just couldn't hear ourselves it was incredible but um, yeah that, that day will live with me for the rest of my life Yes, I was about to say the best day. Wouldn't be, well, probably I wouldn't say the best. My kids might watch this, but like, <laughs> and my missus, but like, uh, it's certainly it's in the top five. And I've only got three kids, and I've only been married once. Oh, so see, you're right. that. <laughs> but um, one thing I wanted to ask you then. So you mentioned a couple of times. Um, so you had the West Brom Aussie our dealers left. So the manager changed, and the deal didn't happen for you. But also when you went to Reading, the manager who brought you in got sacked. 
Um, and I wanted to ask you about, obviously Cardiff have recently sacked Steve Morrison. Callum uh, Robinson came in from West Brom on deadline day or the day before deadline day. And him and a few other players on an international duty, so I think a couple of the Irish boys, basically implied that they came to Cardiff because they bought in to what the manager, they'd come to Steve Morrison. Two weeks later, he's gone. As a player, how do you deal with that? How do you, f- how do you feel? Because I can imagine if Callum Robinson's been talked into, com- not talked into, but convinced, it sounds like it's, you know, no one's holding a gun to his head, of course, but if you buy into the manager and then a week later he's gone, it's got to be frustrating. I think the difference in it, my day to now is agents do all the talking. So if they come into the club, they come into the club for the club. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, the manager will have a little input, but not as much as they had when I when I was about when 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 I was playing. I think because agents do all the work now. Mm-hmm. They do all the dealing with the club. Um, they talk to the club, and if they if the agent feels, I would say, ninety percent sure that this is the right club for the player, the club the player will be going. Yeah. So it's it's hard to say that you know Morrison was the reason that people came to the club because I don't know the situation mm-hmm. but I wouldn't have thought it was the the yeah, big thing okay. I thought they would come to Cardiff because of Cardiff and the deal that the player was getting yeah. but this Cardiff's a it's got a good, good good name you know the city's huge now it's it's not like it used to be what decades ago you know it hasn't got the it's got the bay now it's got restaurants it's got it's a massive city now. It's yeah. not uh, like it's a European city. Yeah. yeah, you know, it's probably. I think somebody I heard somebody saying it's the party capital of Europe. Mm. You know, it's so it's getting a reputation. So players will want to come here now. Yeah, I know it's a good stadium. They know the fans are about. So, you know, it's not not coming to Minion Park, is it? You know, no, <laughs> no, it's fallen, out, no, it's fallen apart, or whatever. What about like? It's got to be a weird one, isn't it, though? Like, if you move from... So, i would use Robinson as an example, but it could be anyone. Like, he's coming from West Brom or whatever, so living up in the Midlands, coming to live in Wales, new place, whatever, and then all of a sudden, what you thought you were signing into, whether it's because of the manager or not, but, like, you know, that's your, your manager and whatever, he's not there, and every footballer knows, and every football fan, I suppose, as well, but... Everyone knows when a new manager comes in, you know, they might not fancy Andy Luck. There's always Absol- that risk. Absolutely. Isn't and he was allowed to sign 17 players. Yes. So those 17 players are all under pressure now. Because when a new manager comes in, he may like a different style, he may like a different player, he may like a. You know, he just, he just don't know what the new manager likes. Um, so you start from scratch where you think you got your place in the team or in the squad at least. You've got to start again. You know, you've got to go and impress again now, or uh, make sure you play well. Otherwise, because you you do you actually start, and I think that's why you see an, an upturn in uh, the teams when the new manager goes in because everybody's fighting. You know, and um, it, it's great. It happened to me when I was at Swansea. I was on my way. I was leaving. I was going to Hereford uh, under Terry Yorath. Terry, Terry had said he's selling me to Hereford. I was going. Come the end of the week, Terry had gone to Bradford. A new manager come in, Ian Evans. Ian Evans played me in a friendly on a Wednesday night, and I was in the first team on the Saturday, and never looked back. So that's how fickle game is. Yeah, how fine the margins are. Oh, right? I was gone. I was going. He, he had he had sold me. I think I think it was ten grand. Um, I was going with ten grand to Hereford. They were in a league at the time, um, and Terry went. And they brought Ian Evans in. Ian Evans said nobody leaves the club, apparently, or, or whatever. He played me in a friendly on a local football pitch. And it was, mm. uh, I don't mean... It was like a park's pitch. Yeah. Uh, it was, Vivi- uh, it was uh, what was it called? Western Avenue in Patalbert. Yeah. And we played um, a St. Joseph's old team or something like that, they were called. And he put me in the team on the, in the, on the Saturday, when, which was incredible. I couldn't believe it because I'd, I'd made my debut under Terry and played it against Bristol City and... Uh, sub a couple of times, but I didn't have a run in the team. Yeah. 
but as soon as Ian Evans came in, I was it was a turn of fortune, and I was so lucky. You had a bit of a mad, um, like a mad start to your career, really, like in terms of, like you jumped from Parks football to to Welsh League football to professional footballer very quickly, and then you were on the brink of going to Hayford and kind of you know it's very much like those slide like those uh, like slide indoors moments in it where you know a split second either way or a split day either way you you know career life can go in a completely different direction do you ever look back on those little moments like um, like you just mentioned where you know you a day or two later they've sacked him and you could have already been gone to Hayford as well and you don't get the opportunity to, to play under Ian Evans well to be fair I think that day when Terry left he, he didn't get sacked he actually left to go to okay. manage Bradford um I think if that hadn't happened, I wouldn't have had the career I did. Uh, to be honest with you, because I think the upheaval of going away for a start and living on my own, I know I was, I was, I was, I was 23, 20, yeah, 22, 23. Still young though, isn't it? And I was think still young, I was naive, I was, because I was brought up in, a, in a, a family environment, but what I'm saying is, I don't think I would have had the career I did. Mm. On, and I can honestly say that, if that, if Terry hadn't have gone, I don't think I would have played as many games as I did. Interesting. And also, I think 23 then is different to 23 now. I think, um, particularly in football, but I think like a 23-year-old now is younger in some ways than what you were when you were 23 back, like when we were 23. Yeah, possibly. I, I, I think there's just a difference. With maybe like social media and technology and things have got to change. But then also I think football's changed because... If you're in the probably top half of the championship Premier League now, and you're in the academy or you're in the you know you're an academy player who trains with the first teams, you, you get everything done for you. You know you get your you 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 haven't got like uh, you're not cleaning the boots of your professional and stuff like that. Which I'm, I'll ask you that. Do you think that the, uh, the YTS boys or whatever they're called now should they still be cleaning? The, have a pro whose boots they clean. And they can also kind of pick their brains a little bit. Yeah, I think so. I um, think it's good, isn't it? I think it's um, some mark of respect because when they cross that line, they get it done and they appreciate it. Um, where nowadays, I think they've got silver spoons in their mouth. They get, I mean, you've got people driving around. I'm not, I'm not envious because th my, day and it, my days are gone. But, you know, you've got apprentices now or whatever driving 40 grand mercs. Yeah, and they never played a first team. Never game. played a game in their life. Uh, will they play a game? Who knows? Um, I yeah, think a little bit of mark of respect of, in my day, you had to knock the first team door to go in. Yeah. If you weren't a first team player, you had to go knock the door and wait for an answer. Now they just walk in, they don't care, they, and they just go. And I just think, I think it's, it's changed. And I think the PFA, I don't know if they... They've got, almost gone too far yeah, the other way, I don't think. They? I don't know if they regret stopping them, giving them a little... What's wrong with cleaning the, the pros' boots? So it's, it's not a dirty job. I can understand stopping them cleaning stands, yeah, that's cleaning right, the ground. I can under, totally under, un, understand that. And um, cleaning the, the ground inside and outside. But clean the boots, I think that's, that's nothing. I think, And that's a, a great way of when you cross the line... You, you get, get your boots cleaned, and I think you appreciate it, and you look after them as well. Yeah, and I like also like if you're um, you know a seventeen seventeen year old striker, say at Man United now, and you're cleaning Ronaldo's boots, or you're keep cleaning, oh, I can't think of anyone else's there, uh, <laughs> Sancho or someone like that. Like if you're cleaning their boots, and you're you know sixteen seventeen year old boy who's training in the first team, but it's on you know very much on the fringes, not really in the squad. And you're able to once a week, you know, you speak to them and you can just have a little chat with them and you can ask them about stuff like that experience and that interaction is priceless. And I think by removing that um, relationship, I do think that that it kind of is taking something away from the education of young footballers. Um, but then I. I do think that the cleaning of the stands and, and that sort of stuff, it was probably time for that to go. Yeah, definitely. But I think just because there was that was time to go didn't mean that 
there was certain other jobs which couldn't be done. And I'm sure there's other stuff apart from the cleaning the booth that could probably be doing. You know, I know they've got kit men and stuff like that. But when I was in like sort of smaller academies and stuff, the younger boys, we'd have to go and collect all the bibs and the cones and yeah. do all. I know they have people to do it now. They're kit, kit managers and all the rest of it. But I don't think there's any harm in I don't think there's any harm in... It teaches you yeah. to tidy up after yourself. Yeah, you know, I don't think there's else. any harm in definitely cleaning boots. I don't... Um, listen, the PFA have done a great, great, great job, to be fair. You know, the, what I what I like about it now is they learn a trade. So if they don't make it as a professional football player, they've got something behind them and they've got some, some substantial. So I think that's... That's right that to had it. to come um, because if they were with academy from ten to seventeen and then got released and there's nowhere to go, they know nothing else. Yeah, um, and it's the the pressure on their mental health as well. Yeah, especially with these days where the academy start at like seven. So if you've been in Cardiff's academy from seven till sixteen, you've progressed through the age groups. So you just assume that oh I've gone from under seven or oh, under eights now under nines and you've gone through all the age groups. You just kind of it's natural, isn't it, that you're just going to assume, well, oh, I'm 16 now, so I'm just going to progress to the to the youth team or to the reserve team or the 23s, whatever it is. But, like, it doesn't work like that because it's, I had Darren Pearson here a couple of weeks back and who's the under-23s manager now, and he was like, what some of these kids don't understand is that when you go from sort of 16, 17 to the tw- under-23, you're not just competing against all the other boys who are trying to get in there you're competing against the, all the other boys from all the other clubs mm-hmm. because they're bringing in to make the 23s as strong as possible. So it's a very different experience. But a child, depending on who their parents are and who their coaches are, they don't necessarily understand that. No. And I think it can be very difficult for players if they've been through or they've been, you know, not necessarily from seven, but if they've been in them from quite young, they can almost psychologically get used to just moving up through the age groups. I think what I'd like to see as well, going back to the old time a little bit, is a reserve league. Yeah, God, yeah. I think um, 23 league, you know, I was... Ponting league. Yeah, I was 23's league uh, manager with Cardiff for two years. And I think I went... I, I look back at the days when um, I went to Middlesbrough for on trial. Um, I played under Bruce Rioch. And I played up front with, um, oh God, I can't remember his name now. He was goal scorer, uh, Bernie Slaven. And to play alongside somebody like him. And then I went to Man City on trial, played a, 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 a league, um, a game, Pontius League game. And I'm up front with him, Maverati. And you look in the players and you think, oh my God. And, and you're playing against players, like coming back from injuries, and you think, wow. Yeah. You know, it's, it's like proper football, where... Listen, I'm not taking anything away from the 23s because it is a competitive league, but I think they benefit more from playing against older pros and coming people coming back from fitness. And I think it'll be better for the players as well, more com- competitive. I, I, and I think that's one thing the league needs to look at and think, right, should we go back to the old Pontins League or, or not Pontins League, or yeah, call it something similar, else, but, but similar and have, <coughs> have two leagues. Make it competitive. Exactly. You can have I, a, I, under 20s squad or whatever can you which is focused on purely on the the you know the, the development, 19, of, the player, the development yeah. of the players and you know i know like darren and 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 mark had when i had him in there they were very very um kind of speaking about like developing young players and like for darren he was saying this for me you know it's not about whether we win the under 23s league it's whether he produces all these players, players the get produced team. for the first team and then if they can't get into the first team, if I produce them, can make them into good footballers where they can go and have a career in football. Um, which I thought was such a, um, a tremendous attitude from him. And I'm sure there's many under-23s managers who have a similar attitude, but I'm also sure there's a few out there who want to win the under-23s league at all costs and uh, yeah, there will be and do it that way. But I think it's, a, it's the right way to do it. You know, if you produce, what it's for, isn't if it? you produce a player... The, the pleasure you get from producing a player or recommending a player to another club or doing something and, it, and that player takes off, you feel a little bit of pride about it, you know, and um, I think Percy's right. Um, I think, But I think it would be more beneficial for the 
for for the young boys anyway to play in a pro- like a professional league competitive yeah, yeah. really and, uh, and they know they're going to be playing up against the ex pros they learn more they learn quicker it'll be better for them and I I'm I, I'm sure imagine all the old pros would say they miss that you know when they yeah. come back and they got to go and play in the twenty threes and there's nobody there you know and it it's no atmosphere. So the other thing is there's 25 man squad in there named at the start of the season but I think they only take 22 or there's only 22 in the match day squad so every week there's three players from the first team probably one of them is a goalkeeper but there's always a couple of players who are not playing football and yeah they might play for the 23s but they don't play as often as what they used to when there was a reserve no. league because you'd have the, th- the few who missed out then you'd also have a couple coming back from injury and then you'd have a mixture of the you know the young and up and coming uh, players as well. well. That, and that's the that's their aim, then, isn't it? To to play from say, eighteens to get into that reserve team because that's the next step. Then I know yeah. the twenty threes is the next step now, but how it's many? It's like they need to put yeah, like a step in between. How many of the twenty threes make it? I don't know when Ruben Culver's done really well to get back in, and Isaac Davis, and we we've, we've had a, a little spread at Cardiff. We've been quite lucky recently, but. At other clubs, not many, n- not yeah. many jumped. So, I, I, I personally like to see Art come back, but whether it will or not, I don't know. I mean, look at the if you look at the big Premier League clubs who spend millions on their academies, like what has the under twenty threes league done for them? Who's come through at the big clubs, like youth players, really in the last ten years? Um, Probably Liverpool is the biggest Liverpool, example. Liverpool, you've got like Harvey Elliott, um, Trent Alexander. Nico Williams um, and Nico Williams and th- there's another one as well as centre back I can't remember his name um, but then United I think what uh, nothing Mason there, Greenwood really and yeah. the rest of them haven't quite broken through maybe Scott McTominay going back a bit further um, Chelsea I mean the the joke was years ago wasn't it that Chelsea would have like 40 players out on loan across the football league and then none of them would ever go back but because they'd been on loan and played X amount of games they'd sell them for a couple of million it was a a mad system they had yeah. but they would, it would also work for them financially because they'd sell these youth players who'd never played a first team game for potential money almost wouldn't it well it's a business that is isn't it it's, yeah. it's like purchasing something and getting extra money for them when you've, when you've made them into but that's completely the opposite attitude to what Darren of course it is, yeah. yeah. It's like he's looking after the player, they're looking after their bank balance. Yeah. Which, look, as we've said a few times today, like football's a business, but the, I, the people within football are what make it what it is, and I think what make it special. And people like Dan Purse and yourself and Mark Hudson, like, I was so impressed by Mark Hudson when he, I, he came in here and we spoke, spoke to him for an hour and 20 minutes. And I couldn't believe that he plays football the way he used to play football, aggressive and, you know, the typical centre-half and how laid back he was and just really, like, just a calm night. Not that he'd be particularly aggressive in here, but just his demeanour was, was like a surf dude. Yeah, you uh, pr- you probably find that, though, that probably the aggressive ones on the pitch are probably the most chilled ones at, off the pitch. It's strange. You don't see many that are uh, <laughs> hot-headed on the pitch. Yeah. Off the Who was the most aggressive player you played with? Oh, I or against? Know. I think probably Stuart Pierce was the probably most aggressive I played against. He was. Um, he seems like a frightening dude. He, 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 uh, to be fair, I gotta be honest. He actually scared me, because um, I knew once he hit me, I knew he was gonna get hit. Because mm. he was such a big boy, and he was like, everything went into it. Probably the most. N- one of the nastiest players that I played with, and I, he, my friend, um, we've been friends for donkey's years now, is a lad called Paul Devlin. <laughs> oh my God, he is yeah, a cool. nutcase, yeah. but absolutely adore him. A, a out and out winner. Um, I had lucky enough to join up with him at Notts County and then went to Birmingham with him. And um, great little player, but so aggressive for a small boy. Mm. Oh. One of a mess. He was one of my favourite guests on the football show. Actually, I, I was really um, like I was. I knew who he was, and I was fairly familiar with him as his playing career and stuff. I hadn't really seen a lot of interviews and stuff with him. I know Andy obviously knew him, and and he came on, and it was just um, just an hour and a half of like just interesting stories, funny stories. He's very talkative lad, and just um, I really liked him. 
He'd love to go to Menure one day, but he lives too far away. Um, just as we sort of look towards wrap it up, um, it, well, someone, uh, one of our members, sent in a question for you, Will. So I'm, you have to excuse me getting my That's phone fine. out. I just got to, my memory's just not good enough to remember it. Let's see if I can bring him up now. Uh, Will, he said, uh, so it's Will who does the uh, charity Super Sex. Um, which we all oh, I'm probably. useless on it. Yeah, he said after he said first question after last season's poor showing, are you going to remember to do your super six more <laughs> often this year? And I haven't. You I, haven't. Have you? I haven't. I, I forget about it all the time. I am useless, honestly. If I, I, I am the worst worst for losing my keys, my wallet, forgetting to do things. I am useless, honestly. I, I went up. The, funny enough, I played golf last week, last Saturday, and I got up there and I forgot my putter. <laughs> so that's how bad I am. I am honestly, I'm shocking. Um, how could you forget your putter to play golf? I know. That's incredible. I had my putter out on a Friday night, just putting about, messing about. Didn't put it back in my bag. Went up there, and I, I had a putter on my, my my pitching wedge. So, were you like that as a player then as well? Forgetful, like you no, stuff. It's no, just something which is. I think it's just something life. later in life. I think as I got older, the worse I've got. Um, <laughs> it's crazy, <laughs> really, but. Yeah, no, I will. I apologise, and I am useless. But and, and technology, I'm not the best on it as well. So, um, so the kind of the the subject which I wanted to finish on was Wales anyway, and Will has set me up nicely with the question which he's asked, which was, he says, coming into the program quite late as we discussed, um, twenty two. Did you have any aspirations for playing for Wales once you'd got into the professional game? And then once you pulled on that Welsh jersey, what was it like the first time you uh, walked out? I can honestly say not a chance I thought about it. Not once playing for Wales. Um, when it happened, it was like, I don't know, just a dream. Mm. Um, when, I, when I look back at my career, I think it's a dream. I, I know I just, I was such a lucky, a lucky boy. Um, everything was a bonus for me. And to... To play for Wales for my own country, I think it was Switzerland that made my debut, I think. I think, yeah, Switzerland away. Um, it was amazing to be in around the players like the Neville Southalls and the Gary Speeds and the Chris Coleman. Well, Chris, I played with the Swansea anyway, but I knew them. Uh, and, you know, Mark Pembridge's and Mark Hughes. And you just look around and you think, what am I doing here? No. You know, because... At times, I didn't feel I was worthy of being there. At at times, honestly, and that's that's the person I was though, because I was, I'd always try and not challenge myself, but I'd always think I'm not as good as what people think I am, because I used to, I used to worry about my game. Get inside your own head a little bit. Isn't yeah, it? I, my own battle was with myself. Mm. Um, I had to, for me, I had to have an argument or a or a fight or something in my head to say, look, I've got to show somebody that I, I can do this. Get your pride uh, up. Yeah, because the day, because uh, Frank knew how to, to manage me, um, the day he used to put his arm around me and cuddle me, that it was the day I'd be poor on the pitch. Yeah. He knew I, he'd have to get into me to get get me riled before I went out. So you want to go and prove a point. Yeah. And yeah. and I think, I think there's a little demons I had in my head when the club came from non-league. I always had, because I was so small when I when I was a kid, and that's why I had to play in goals. Um, I know it sounds stupid, but I was mm. the smallest, but I was in goals. And then when I did play out a few times, because they, I had bigger boys against me, I had to prove something. I had to be better than them, I had to be stronger than them, and I think, or more aggressive than them, or whatever, or run more than them. I had to try and beat them. Yeah. I had to have that... Um, mental thing where I thought right you're not going to beat me and that's the way I went on the pitch I used to look at the, who I was playing against and thinking right you ain't getting the better of me today and don't get me wrong they got the better of me through a lot, a lot of times but mm -hmm. I'd always try to get the better of them Did um, was there any sort of particular player who you had like ongoing battles with over your career or like every time you played a particular player someone who Maybe you not not necessarily didn't see eye to eye to it, but you just had a good intense battle every time. No, not really. I can't think of it. Got the better of all of them. No, <laughs> not really. I can remember Noel Blake smashed me once, and I thought to myself, right, I'm going to smash you back. 
But I tried to smash him back, and I think I hurt myself. <laughs> but but uh, yeah, that was a. We played Stoke, and I've got a, I've got a picture of it, and it's it's amazing. He's he's off the floor. He's got two feet coming towards. I've got one coming towards my chest, and one coming towards my thigh. And he actually took my thigh that year, and um, I'm I'm just about to cross it, and I got a photo of it, and he actually nailed me. So about, I think I actually went off, and then next time we played him, I thought to myself, right, you were having it, mm. and I tried to smash him. Oh my god, and I I think I hurt myself, and I didn't want to. Sh- In my our days, you never went down. No, of course. You, tra- you tried to get up and show you wasn't hurt. Oh my God, I was in pain, <laughs> and I thought to myself, I am not going after him again. But uh, yeah, he's a he's a big lad, and this I enjoyed every challenge. Um, I can't say I enjoyed a couple of months at Cardiff yeah. <laughs> at the first, honestly, yeah. because I was having death threats. I was having all hate mail. It was that bad, yeah. Of both fans, not not just Cardiff fans. Yeah, I bet the Swansea fans weren't uh, happy that no, you went there either. No, the Swansea fans. Had, um, in fact, we used to open my mail on a Monday because we saw so much of it. And we used to come in the dressing room and we used to, the players just say, oh, we open your mail and open your mail. And, and we used to open the mail and there was one occasion at uh, Winston Faber, the old Dutch lad. He said, can I open one? I said, of course you can. And he opened it and he did that. And there was a razor blade in the thing and he caught his finger. So that's how nasty it did get. And they, they had to call the police in on that one. Yeah, um, I'm surprised. But um, was that difficult for your wife as well? Then no, I, I didn't tell her. Didn't. I didn't tell you her about kept that. I, I didn't tell her about death threats and things like that. No, no, because I thought I, there's no benefit to it. Is there? No, and I thought death threats. What's who's going to kill me? You know, yeah. I mean, they can they can criticise me and they can slag me off. It's like vitriol, and yeah, for, but uh, stupid. And it's not nice, but but it was it was. Um, it was a concern at one stage because you know I think Frank was a little concerned at, at one time. Um, he tried to I think try and stop my mail, or hide yeah. it. But um, I I knew it was coming. And just give it this different. But it was, it was quite funny because yeah. when I first came and I I can remember walking into the uh, thing and the, the first person I saw was Ernie, <laughs> and uh, I said something to Ernie and he burst out laughing, and I thought I was sub on the Saturday. At Ninian Park, and I got up, and the, the, the chorus of booze came up. Oh dear. And I went back and I sat down on the bench. And I said, Frank, I'm not going on. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he laughed and he winked and he went, All right. And, um, but that was good. That was a couple of games where I, I was sub because I wasn't fit when I came from Reading because I hadn't trained properly for about three months or two months or whatever. So Frank had to get me fit. And then he started playing me in little bits and bobs. And I think I scored in one of the games, and I got—I I thought I'd celebrate, and the abuse I had, and I thought, oh, I'm not going to celebrate again. <laughs> <laughs> but I look back now, and it's fond memories, and I wouldn't change them for the world. Yeah. I know I had a, a great time. Um, and I, I Do you ever get it things. now, like from people, whether it's in the streets or social media or whatever, just um, like the odd Swansea yeah, or kind yeah, of you fun. get the odd one or two. But nothing. I mean, I've been retired now a long time, so. Yeah. But I, but yeah, I football get, fans hold a grudge. Don't I get a bit of stick now and then, but. I, you know, I just I smile and give them a wink and have a laugh, but. I think they. they I think half the time, the best way to deal with that sort of thing, for, for with a football point of view, is with a bit of a wink and a smile and play the villain a little bit and then. You know, the, uh, most they, of them. Is, I think most most fans are understandable. Yeah, I think you know. Obviously, Swansea fans have been disappointed. That I came to Cardiff, and Cardiff didn't want me here because I was a jack, and yeah. I, that, that was the, that was the issue. And you got you're gonna go you, if you don't come through challenges in life, you're not gonna you're not gonna survive. Exactly that. And the thing is, you probably you'd have a large percent of those of those people who were effing and blinding and calling you all the names under the sun in the ninth minute or whatever it was. They seen you after after the ground. They'd want your autograph, or they'd want a phone, or you know, they'd want if there was phones then, and they really wanted a photo and all this sort of thing, innit? Yeah. So like, as much as they were giving you grief, they also wanted. Oh yeah. They yeah. respected you as a footballer and I, as a player, I think. But do you know, I still, I still love driving into Ninian Park because not a lot of people know it, and I shouldn't be saying it really, but mm. I think Frank will forgive me now. We used to, when I used to play away from home. I wasn't, I'd never run for 90 minutes. I'd run for about 80 odd minutes and I'd be tired in the last five, 10 minutes. Okay. 
So Frank said to me, he said, uh, why, you, why do you run a home for 90 minutes, but you run 80 minutes away? He said, you're tired in the last five minutes. And I said, you don't feed me enough. Mm -hmm. So I missed the burger van right by the door <laughs> and in <laughs> your back <laughs> because I used to have a burger every game. Every home ah, game. Okay. And my car park space was right by the burger van. So you used to grab one. So I used to have a burger in the car and then walk into the ground. Beautiful. But uh, didn't have that at the way games. No, couldn't have that at the way games. And um, there you go. That lady, she used to serve the best burgers ever. Yes. Food keep you going, isn't it? Yeah. Um, just quickly, were you in the Wales setup when Vinnie Jones came in? Yeah. What yeah. was that like? Because I look back, we laugh about it all the time. It's like Vinnie Jones, ex Wales captain. Yeah, it was. Um, Got a Wales tattoo as well, yeah. It was. It was funny that night because uh, Bobby Gould was in charge, and uh, he said, um, "Piece of paper each," and it was like a ballot to vote for the captain. I think, I think who, who was who was the captain? Nev was that? Was it Nev was out? No, Nev was playing. So it would have been who was captain at the time? Uh, was, would have been Ratcliffe. No. Eric Young. No, I can't try and think of who would have been captain anyway. I don't know. I don't know. So anyway, we, we had a vote. So I, I, I voted for Nev. And then some, so we, we they put the ballots in. So probably would have come out and he said, the winner is Vinnie Jones. Jeez. So everyone went, did you vote for Vinnie? I went, no, I voted for Nev. <laughs> What you vote for? I voted for Nev. I voted for him. I voted for Nev. I voted. So Nev had won by a, a majority. A landslide. Yeah, but Vinnie Jones got the captaincy. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, Bobby was there. Played that one a little bit sneaky, I think. Mm. How was he received, Vinnie Jones, and uh, by by the players and the, the uh, kind of? Uh, all right, I think. Yeah, he was. I mean, all he played, I think. One game with his Cockney him. accent. Yeah, he, he was as Cockney as they come. It's not like these days where there's like Welsh sort of grandparents or they were born in Wales and then they moved away and they, he was yeah proper cockney like he was a funny lad to be fair mm -hmm. um but no I only I, like I said I think it was my I think it was Switzerland away uh, that they actually got that captaincy job um and that would have been my first game so I, I only played I think once or two squads with him so I didn't really get to know him that well no. um I, obviously John Arton knew him really well yeah of course and John used to speak highly of him you know um, I think he's actually an underrated I think people um, put now with hindsight they kind of paint him as like a, an old school like hard man footballer but I think he was better than that like I think he was better than just you know tackling and hurting people and intimidation he had all that but I think he was a bit better than I that I think he was a bit better than that yeah I think um, to, to play in the top league you can't you can't be that bad a player. Yeah, I think he's played most of his career at Premier League or yeah. Division One. Yeah, you know you, you don't go to the, the likes of Leeds and places like that if you're you're a poor player. No. So I think you know he it's unjust unjustified that um, they just class him as a hard man. Right? Yeah. I mean he's struggling now, bless him. He's Hollywood Hollywood yeah, actor. Yeah, he's struggling out in LA, isn't he? So. Yeah, bless him. <laughs> Uh, Andy, it's been a pleasure, mate. I could literally sit here and, and, and I could talk to you for hours and hours and hours, but um, it's uh, got to keep the time. Got to keep the people wanting more, mate. Got to keep them wanting more. But um, you're definitely you're welcome back at any time, mate. I would love to get you back in perhaps in a couple of months. Yeah, I'll tell you some stories. I'll tell you some stories about um, some of the managers. Yeah, because name them all. Because I, th I think <laughs> I think sometimes that uh, I must have just drawn to man managers because. Yeah. Played under Vary Fry, played under Frank Burrows, Sam Man, Sam as well, as well. Mad. I tell you loads of stories about Sam. What's the What's the maddest thing that you've seen Sam Man do? Well, or say. Well, Sam, when he bought the club, he actually came in, and um, the apprentices used to obviously used to come in to see us in the, in the dressing room, see if we wanted anything, and the, my apprentice come running in. Legs, legs. It wasn't me. It wasn't me. And I was going. What are you on about? He said it wasn't me. It wasn't me. So, so the apprentice disappeared. So I'm thinking, well, what, what, what wasn't you? So I walked outside, and Sam had paid a woman five pound per tire to let it down in the car park. So I've gone and I go, Sam. Yeah. I said, Sam, what are you doing? I said, I've got to get home. Blah blah blah. Do you want to buy a pump, a tenner? 
<laughs> so he's made a fiver, didn't he? Yeah. So he's done that to all the Celtic players. So Goalie said, get him back, he'd love it. So I thought, all right, I'll, I'll wait, I'll bide my time. So the next day, he's got his cream, uh, a light, light grey suit on, dressed, you know, really smart. He's doing the press and stuff. And he's at the training ground with Tanner and me. And we had a veranda up the top. So I had this yeah. bin, and I, was, I can't tell you what was in there. It was a bit of everything in it. So I put the bin on the, on the, on the oh, veranda. Yeah. So I said, call him. Mm. So they called him, and it was like you put him on an X. So I've dropped it, but I've dropped the bin as well. Oh no. So the bin has hit him. <laughs> all the stuff has hit him on his, all on his suit. His suit is stinking. And he, <laughs> he looked up, can I swear? Yeah, yeah. He said, uh, welcome to World War Three, you Welsh <laughs> bastard. <laughs> 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 but we had to have a, a three month spell where we did uh, tricks on each other. Yeah. I'd walk in and my trousers would be cut in half or I'd have half a tie or no buttons on my shirt or socks cut out or no laces in my shoes. I took his windscreen wipers off the car when he was pouring down. I put a banana up his exhaust pipe. I, I wrecked his office one day uh, it, it, and he called me in after three months and he, he said, I think Legs, I think we'll call it a day. <laughs> we'll call it but a the thing was, I think Sam was pretty thick and naive because he, were, he had to pay for a new suit for me every time he ripped my suit up. Yeah. But uh, I, yeah. I I loved him a bit, and like I and say, you say you fell out with him towards the end. Yeah, I fell out with him. I can't I can't really go into detail, but he told me one thing. It wasn't to do with the pranks, though. No, it's it nothing to do with the pranks. Far. No, I know. <laughs> but he told me one thing um, with Lenny Lawrence, and I come back off holidays, and he changed his mind, um, and I said, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not prepared to do what you're asking me to do. And he, in other words, he said, right, off. Mm. So I said, right, okay, well. So that's what I did, it was man of pride, I went. Um, but then in the press, he's saying he didn't want me to leave. Yeah. But he actually told me to, no way, to go. So, but I, I forgave him. Yeah. I, two years, two, it took two years, mine, before I forgave him. And then I came back and I came to the club presentation and uh, we had a beer together and we had a laugh. and. As I say, he rings me once a year now, so we get on. Do you think um, you're a man of principles, man of kind of like morals, whereby if you feel like someone's bullshitting you a little bit, you're like more likely to walk away than you are put up with it? I hope so, because I think I did that when I went to West Brom. I did that when I went to Cardiff, when I left Cardiff. Um, I, the biggest regret for me at Cardiff was if I'd known my last game was at the Millennium Stadium, I would have made the most of it. But yeah. if you see any footage of the game after the game, I'm not on the pitch, I've gone. I've gone in, I've given my boots to somebody and the socks or whatever, and I've gone in the training room and I, I spent, I think it was about 15 minutes on my own before the players came in, just sitting there on my own, taking in what we what we just done. Yeah. And I think I would have made more of it and said bye to the fans yeah. and waved and appreciated it and whatever. But I think that was my biggest regret. Yeah, see, I could a hundred percent understand that because, like, being able to say goodbye to to your home fans and and and, so, and on such a big occasion when you finally got promotion after coming close, you know, a couple of times with, in the years prior, but also I can understand as a as a Cardiff boy and a Welshman the the need in the Millennium Stadium to kind of go and sit in the changing room on my own and just take it in yourself like because yeah you're in wales's ground wales's rugby ground wales's football ground cardiff have just got promoted finally you've got the emotions i can understand that a lot it was um but it, like i say I, I just disappeared because i was in the celebrations on the stage obviously and then we walked uh, players walked all around the ground i walked just a little bit and then i went in and i must have been 10 15 minutes on my own at least um and it was it it was a nice, you know, it was tranquil. I sat there and just, I took my shorts off, took my tops off, took everything. I just sat there and I just thought, I was like, not exhausted, but felt relieved. Yeah, yeah. Because the, the pressure on us that day was pretty well, immense. For a few years, the pressure to go up as well was, was gaining on Cardiff, wasn't it? Because yeah. we, we had come close against Stoke and 
fallen at the sort of kind of very final hurdle. Yeah. And I think that relief to to finally get it over the line in Cardiff was a massive, massive thing. But, but the drive, the drive in that day, would you know that would live with you for the rest of your life. If you were on that coach, just to come through the sea of blue, um, it was it was just incredible. You know, yeah. you could see the excitement on the fans going into the change and into the ground <coughs> and then driving up the street and in, in, nearly into the ground, and it's like absolutely chock a block, and you think. We we got yeah. a win. Special, special. I mean, it was, just felt like it was meant to be. I got to be honest. But um, oh, what a day! What a day! We'll definitely do a part two soon, mate. I think. Absolutely, I think, uh, I'll tell you some stories it. about the Mad Men. Yes, indeed. Thank you very much. It's been an absolute no pleasure. Problem. Really enjoyed it. Um, guys, please do like, subscribe, all that stuff, and uh, of course, check out Andy Legg's career. Legendary. Thank you.